speaker is uh, Talat. He's going to talk about um, partition of India. Um, and uh, Talat uh, Ahmed is his National UK member from Edinburgh and a lecturer in South Asian, South Asian excuse me, history at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you, Jay. Well, 70 years ago this August um, is going to be the 70th anniversary of Indian independence um, on the 14th and 15th of August in 1947. British rule came to a crushing end. Um, the jewel in the crown, as Disraeli famous referred to India, um, was suddenly lost by the biggest empire that the world had ever seen. And obviously, for us as socialists, for people who are revolutionaries, for people who are radicals and stand against racism, imperialism and oppression, this is a cause for celebration in terms of seeing the end of British rule in India and it ushered in a whole process of decolonization that we witnessed in the decades to come after. The, uh, after 1947. So this is a cause for celebration. However, there is also another side to that independent story, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today, and that is the history of partition. Because although though independence came and the British were kicked out, we had the birth of two nation states, India and Pakistan, and these states were born in blood. Um, and the amount of bloodshed that, uh, that was witnessed was absolutely unprecedented in the history of this part of the world and in many other parts of the world. I mean, there were some estimates which say that up to 75,000 women were raped. Many of them were disfigured. Um, some of them were also dismembered um, in situations where you had uh, blokes, you know, groups of men going around and just grabbing women that they saw as belonging to a particular community and inflicting this on them. One particular historian writes that gangs of killers set whole villages aflame, hacking to death men and children, um, the aged, while carrying off young women to be raped. Some British soldiers and journalists um, who had witnessed the Nazi death camps claimed that partition's brutalities were worse. They argued, they said that pregnant women had their breasts cut off and babies were hacked out of their bellies. Infants were found literally roasted on pits. Um, another document from the time um, described a man who was tied to a connector box of the tram lines uh, with a small hole drilled into his skull so that he would bleed to death as slowly as possible. Um, the same um, author goes on to state that a Hindu mob stripped a 14-year-old boy naked to confirm that he was circumcised so as to check that he was a Muslim. And when they confirmed that he was a Muslim, the boy was uh, then thrown into a pond, held down with bamboo poles, and a Bengali engineer who was educated in England uh, noting at the time that he took to die on his Rolex wristwatch and wondering how tough the life of the Muslim bastard was. The American photojournalist Margaret Bork White um, was in India in the last few months in the lead up to independence and partition. And if you look online, many of the photographs from that period um, are her photographs. She had also witnessed the opening of the gates of the concentration camps a year earlier. Um, and she wrote about the violence in Calcutta in 1947. She said that they looked like Buchenwald to her. Now, it's for these reasons that the partition of India and the violence that it was born out of has been described as the closest thing to South Asia's Holocaust. Now, that violence, that brutality, that suffering stands in sharp contrast to the former colonial power, the British. Um, remember, Britain had ruled that part of the world for almost 200 years, and in much of those 200 years, it had been marked by incredible levels of violence inflicted by the colonial state on Indians, which I will talk about in a little while. But um, the um, British writer, William Dalrymple, turned around and said that for the British, the British army were able to march out of the country with barely a shot fired and only seven casualties on their side. So you get in that sense, uh, you know, some sense of what the of what the um, the significance of what it was actually like in 1947. Now, in one sense, the question has to be posed: How could such brutality, how could such terror on such a horrendous level, have taken place? Um, now, of course, the 
the most um, the most widespread conventional explanation that's put forward is the simplest one, which effectively is that it's because the peoples of that part of the world were not able to live together in any kind of harmony whatsoever. And it was only thanks to the British, because of their rule, that they prevented the natural bloodshed, the natural enmity that has always existed, particularly between the two largest groups of that subcontinent, of course, Hindus and Muslims. Um, and that it was only the British that fostered any sense of communal unity, but of course, once they began their exit strategy, then of course we had the descent into violence because you basically have um, atavistic attitudes which have always existed amongst these peoples because after all they are, you know, Orientals. What do you expect of these brown-skinned peoples? They're not civilised. They have no sense of rationality. They just resort all the time to their religious passions which are somehow, you know, part and parcel of the water that they drink in that part of the world. And therefore, uh, that's, the, that's the convenient explanation that it was just natural hatreds um, coming to the fore. Um, and that somehow that's the explanation and there was nothing that we could do about this um, and that was in, in, um, inexplicable in many respects. Um, it's interesting because even inside of um, the subcontinent, um, at the time of 1947, in the immediate weeks and months after this violence was taking place, there were a whole series of writers who were very secular-minded themselves who started putting pen to paper because it was the only way that they felt that they could make sense of the bloodshed that they were witnessing and that they were hearing about. And many of their short stories Stories, many of their poetry is incredibly tender and very, very, um, you know, very, very evocative of the era. Um, but at the same time, in many of these writers, you have a sense that somehow there was just this inexplicable madness that just took hold of these people, these ordinary people who, after all, were semi-educated, uncouth, um, and therefore they just, uh, you know, unleashed their natural passions. Um, now. You know, if that was the case, then how come the history of India and the subcontinent before the British, before European settlement and colonisation of the region, how come such holocausts have not been witnessed before? I mean, that's the simple evidence that has to be put forward because there were no holocaust and violence on that particular scale inside of this part of the world in the pre-modern era. So therefore, it can't just be, the explanation cannot just be to do with the fact that somehow these age-old hostilities have always existed amongst Hindus and Muslims. And when we think about the history of India, um, and the history of this part of the world is a history not just of Hindus and Muslims, it's also a history of lots of other peoples and cultures. You're talking about this place being the birth of Hinduism, uh, you know, one of the oldest, if you want to phrase it, you know, religious traditions in the world. It also is the birthplace of Sikhism, of Buddhism, of Jainism, but it is also a place where the three monotheistic faiths also travelled to in different forms. They went either as emissaries, as travellers, um, as invaders, as uh, uh, forms of pilgrimage, whatever. But in one form or another, Christians, Muslims and Jews also made India their home in the pre-modern era. So in other words, this part of the world is a part of the world that was completely and utterly syncretic in terms of its cultural traditions and the kinds of peoples that lived um, uh, that lived in this particular peninsula. Now, that does not mean to say that I am suggesting for one single moment that therefore everything was rosy in the Garden of India and that somehow there had never existed any kind of tensions or conflicts between different groups. But when it comes to questions of identity, there were far more other um, points and markers that people had in common than religion as we understand it. So, for example, and obviously we're talking about pre-modern era, we're talking about <coughs> societies where village bonds and village ties were seen as being much more important. We're talking about a society where linguistic traditions and common dialects were seen as being much more significant as markers of identity and commonality than the issue of religion per se as we understand it in the modern era. Um, and so therefore the question has to be posed by serious, um, you know, by serious socialists and activists, but also by serious scholars if they're going to be serious about their work, as to how come religion suddenly comes to occupy such a central part um, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and here it's very, very significant because um, the question and the role 
of what the nature of British rule was about in India really has to be posed. Now, again, um, I, can, you know, I can foresee exactly what some people will say. Ah, just typical members of the SWP in your sort of, you know, Marxist analysis and interpretation. You just want to lay everything at the fault of the British. Uh, you just want to talk in a crude way um, about how they just divide people, etc., etc. Well, you know, I don't want to suggest that at all. What I want to suggest is that I think we have to look at the evidence in terms of trying to understand how exactly we begin to see the crystallization of ideas. And when I say the crystallization of ideas, I'm talking particularly about the idea of religion and religious identity beginning to take hold in, uh, in this part of the world. And you don't necessarily have to take my word for it. Um, there are two historians of the partition of India who are not, um, they're, they're certainly not revolutionaries, they're not even socialists. Um, one of them, Yasmin Khan, who wrote her book, The Great Partition, she states that the partition stands as a testament to the follies of empire, which ruptures community, evolution, distorts historical trajectories, and forces violent state formation from societies that would otherwise have taken and uh, would have taken different and unknowable paths. Um, another historian who's written a book called Indian Summer, which came out a few years ago about the partition of India, said that when the British started to define communities based on religious identity and attached political representation to them, many Indians themselves stopped accepting the diversity of their own historical tra uh, tra trajectories. Very, very important to, to note this. And therefore, the schism that exists between Hindu and Muslim um, is something that we can actually pinpoint to a whole series of factors and events in British society. Now, one thing we do know about, um, about India is that when the British went there, they did instigate and inspire revolt against their rule. The most, I mean, there were many, and I'm not going to go into that, but the most famous, of course, is the one that takes place in, in 1857, uh, which is referred to as the mutiny or the rising against the British. <coughs> And it was absolutely huge. Um, you know, for the first time in India, you, begin, you began to see whole groups of Indians in different parts of, uh, of India, but particularly in the north, coming together to oppose the British. And it took the British the best part of a year to quell this uh, rebellion. And it also ushered in a very different period of rule inside of British India because the rebellion was in part against the ruthless extractive machinery of the East India Company, which is seen as being completely oppressive to Indians. Um, and it forced a fundamental change in British rule in India because suddenly direct rule was imposed from India and there were a whole series of so-called reforms that were enacted. But what was very significant about that rule was that it completely altered the way that the British began to view India at, at the time. And it's very interesting. Before the mutiny took place, the in, inside of um, India, in the British Army, um, the, Indian, the British Army was made up of 34,000 Europeans and over a quarter of a million Indians. That was before the mutiny. Once the mutiny had happened, there was an, a dramatic change because suddenly the ratio of Indian to British was reduced to two to one because there was an insistence that there had to be a one-third white army. In addition to that, they, this was done deliberately to try to prevent what they had witnessed in 1857, which was a sense of the coming together of people uh, from all kinds of backgrounds. And the British had learned a very important lesson from that mutiny, and that was we have to ensure it never happens again. How are we going to ensure it never happens again? Well, they did this, and again, you don't have to take my word for it. These are the words um, of, Charles, of Charles Wood, who was the Secretary of State for India at the time. He said, in order to prevent communal unity, I wish to have a different and rival spirit in different regiments of the army, so that a Sikh might fire into a Hindu, into a Gurkha, into either, without any scruple in case of need. It went one step further. Uh, Field Marshal Lord Roberts started theorizing the notion of martial states in, uh, sorry, martial races inside of India in the, from the late 19, 1880s onward. And this concept was used to justify a very selective recruitment policy inside of the British Army. So they favoured groups such as Sikhs, 
such as Gurkhas. In some cases, they also favoured certain types of Pathans because these were the groups that were seen as being relatively acquiescent at the time of the mutiny, and therefore these were groups that were seen as being somehow immune to any kind of nationalist stirrings and nationalist aspirations to unite against, uh, against the British. As British rule began to deepen throughout of India in the latter half and the latter quarter of the 19th century, you began to see policies of co-option, you began to see policies of repression, and also, of course, the setting of various groups off against each other and the key, the key thing about the British uh, strategy at this time was that they changed tactics, they adopted different types of tactics according to the needs at that particular moment in, uh, at that particular moment in time. And they also switched sides as to which particular groups they favoured. And this is very, very important because traditionally inside of India, when the British first went there, their initial sort of solidarity and understanding was mostly with Muslims at the time. Um, and uh, so, for example, um, I mean, even as late as 1945, uh, Wavell, who was the penultimate, um, the penultimate viceroy of India, um, believed that Muslims, that the British should always forge close alliances with the Muslims, as they had done back in the 18th and early 19th century. Um, initially, the senior military figures in the uh, in the Raj favoured Muslims because they saw them as being clean-limbed honest, fighting, hardy men, whereas the Hindu was seen as just being lazy, lying about, reciting Sanskrit poetry, fanning himself, etc., etc. Now here you can begin to see very, very clearly how all kinds of racial, and let's be honest, that's what they are, characteristics are being applied to both Muslims and also to Hindus and also to a whole series of other groups inside of India throughout the, um, throughout the 19th century. Um, after the mutiny, of course, the British decide to switch sides because suddenly the Muslim is no longer trustworthy because as far as they're concerned, the mutiny had been inspired by those that had some kind of allegiance to the formal Mughal emperors, etc., etc., and therefore the Muslims were no longer trusted, and they began to switch allegiance. And it's very interesting because in the latter quarter of the 19th century, the British were very happy to see an increase and rise in the educated, professional, middle-class Hindu elites. Um, and they were very pleased to see this elite emerge. This begins to change, particularly after 1885, because in 1885 you have the formation of the Indian National Congress. Now, although this is an elite organisation, nevertheless, it's an organisation which begins to put into practice and is an expression of the aspirations by the time we get to the end of the 19th century for a desire for some kind of control, some kind of representation, not necessarily outside independence, but nevertheless some kind of Indian representation in the governance of their own affairs. Of course, for the British, this is total anathema, and they don't like this, and of course the, um, the Congress is dominated by Hindus, and they also don't particularly like this. Um, and so they begin to think about different strategies here again, based upon policies of co-option, setting one group off, of it, off, another, off against another. Within, within 15 years, sorry, within 20 years of the Indian National Congress being formed, at the start of the 20th century, in 1905, they, their strategy comes to fruition in terms of setting groups up against each other. And Lord Curzon, uh, who is the Governor General, of Bengal province, and Bengal had been the most significant province of British India. It was first of, of after all, uh, Calcutta is the main city there. Calcutta was the centre of the British Empire, of the East India Company before that as well. It was um, a very elite area, a very developed area. And Curzon decided to partition Bengal in 1905. Now this was done apparently on the ground uh, to make effective administration. Um, however, um, the Home Secretary at the time, Herbert Risley, uh, summed up the view in a much more candid um, terms. He said that Bengal United is a powerhouse. Bengal divided will pull in different ways. One of our main objects is to split up and thereby weaken a solid body of opponents to our rule. A separate administration with separate courts, etc., etc., etc. He says the Hindu Zamandari, so this is a, an elite layer of landlords and what have you. Um, they are patrons to the Congress and they would find the Muslim peasantry ranged against them, secure in the support of the Dhaka Secretariat. It would divide the nationalist ranks 
once and for all. Now, Risley, the author of these words, was also the first enumerator and the first census taker of British India. And he was responsible for codifying different, uh, different groups of Indians. And he codified them on the basis of Hindu, Muslims, beginning to define very, very clearly what a Hindu was, what a Muslim was, what their characteristics were, you know, right down to measuring their noses, checking what the spaces were between their eyes, how thick their lips were, how tall or thin or small, short, stocky, etc. And all of these were predicated on these racial stereotypes which are emanating out of the colonial sciences at the time to apply to Indians. So in other words, the process of the crystallization of these identities, we can begin to see very, very clearly. And of course, they didn't just stop there. A year later, in 1906, we have the formation of the All India Muslim League. Uh, yes, the All India Muslim League. Now, the Muslim League, many people think that somehow Jinnah, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the um, the first leader of Pakistan, uh, that somehow he was the you know, brainchild behind the Muslim League. Well, no, he wasn't the brainchild behind the Muslim League. He doesn't come to the fore until much, much later. But when the Muslim League is formed, its objectives were to promote loyalty to the British government, to protect and advance the political rights and interests of Muslims of India, and respectfully represent their needs and aspirations to the government. On the issue of the partition of Bengal, whereas most Indians were opposed to the partition, the Muslim League declared that the partition of Bengal was beneficial to the Muslims, and it condemned the agitation against the, part, uh, against, um, the partition and said that um, the Muslim League and that the partition could play a positive role in the defense of empire. Now, of course, the British loved this. And to, um, to show their gratitude to the All India Muslim League, three years later, they introduced separate electorates. Separate electorate meant that they recognised that Hindus and Muslims became separate political categories in the legislative elections that were, being, that were taking place in the early part of the 20th century. And this categorization of Hindus and Muslims uh, not only began to encourage political parties like the Indian National Congress and the All India Muslim League to begin to start thinking of themselves as religious categories and political categories. But more fundamentally, of course, it begins to have an impact upon the mass of the Indians themselves in terms of how their political aspirations were being raised. Because you begin to see the fissures immediately in the attempt to try and forge unity and to keep unity amongst Indians. You begin to see the divide of religion being used as a tactic in all of this. Um, now, this comes to a head um, throughout the early part of the 20th century, and it really comes to a head during the Second World War. Because in the middle of the Second World War, in, um, in 1942, a very significant movement arises to challenge British rule. This is the Quit India movement. It's launched by Gandhi on the 8th of August in 1942. Uh, where the mantra is, do or die, we have to rise up against the British. The British either leave India or we're going to force them out of here. Now, this, of course, remember, is in the middle of the war. No way the British are going to tolerate this. So, of course, what do they do? Repression. They sling all the leaders of Congress into jails, um, and most of them are detained for the duration of the war. What does the All India Muslim League do? It comes out and offers its support to the British and their war effort, swears its tr uh, historical traditional loyalty to the British, goes back to the pre-1857 days and uses that and says, look at us, we've always been um, loyal, we've always worked in party with the British and so we will do again in your hour of need. We are here, we can guarantee the support of the Muslims for the British war effort. The British in return? Of course, they're very happy about this because, of course, Congress are detained. There's very little agitation by Congress leaders and by Congress activists. For a short period, the Quit India movement does lead quite spectacular revolts against the British. But sadly, this doesn't last very long and the British are able to repress this and they quell it very, very effectively through using aerial bombardment um, and, um, and sheer brute force. What do they do with the Muslim League? Of course, the Muslim League is free to operate legally in the period of the war, but not only that. Some of you might be familiar uh, in Pakistan, the national newspaper there is the Dawn newspaper. It's like the equivalent of, I don't know, the Times, um, 
uh, you know, maybe the Independent and the Guardian, uh, but it certainly has the status of the Times as being seen as a very old newspaper of Pakistan. <laughs> well, it was born in 1942-1943 in this period because the All India Muslim League, which by this stage is being led by Jinnah, decides that he needs to have an organ, he wants a newspaper to propagate his ideas, etc., about um, the Muslim League and that the Muslim League is the natural representation of all Muslims. Uh, but of course, they don't have much finances. So where do the finances come from? Courtesy of the British. The British are very, very happy to provide um, money for the print works, uh, money to ensure that the circulation happens, and also, of course, to make sure that it is translated into several languages, because initially it comes out in English, but they do have it translated particularly into Urdu, uh, because this is the other thing that's going on here, is the way that the attempt is being made to try to increasingly identify the language of Urdu, which is used, uh, uh, written in um, using the Persian and Arabic um, script to try and argue that somehow this is the natural language of Muslims and what have you. Um, and, um, and, this gets, and this gets worse because as the war is coming to an end, um, the elections that I talked about uh, previously, uh, the British throughout the 1920s and 30s have been extending the electorate. Uh, by 1935, the electorate had extended to 35 million people. And the first election that took place before the war was in 1937. Remember, this is under separate electorates. Um, the Muslim League did really, really, really badly. It was the Congress that scored spectacular victories in the 1937 election, uh, winning the majority of seats in the provincial assemblies as they were at the time. The next election, that so the Muslim League in this sense had not succeeded in prosecuting its notion, its basis, its raison d'etre, that they were the only representative of the Muslims. And even with the separate electorates where they were guaranteed seats in so-called Muslim dominant areas, they couldn't get any victories. Nine years later, by 1946, we have a very different picture. The war is over, another election is called. In 1946, Jinnah has also learnt a trick or two, and he's learned a trick or two from Gandhi. Because again, people have this notion that somehow Jinnah is the big bad baddie here. He's the black sheep of the Indian family because he was hull bent on partition from the word go, and he's the father of Pakistan, etc., etc. And he introduced religion into, polit into the Indian political spectrum. Uh, it wasn't Jinnah who introduced uh, religion into the political mainstream of Indian politics. Jinnah was um, a staunch secularist. Um, you know, he was practically an atheist. Uh, he had no problems drinking whiskey. He had no problems eating ham and pork. Uh, he also married a woman who was a Parsi, who was a very glamorous daughter of a wealthy business magnate, etc. Um, she certainly didn't cover her hair or go in purda anywhere. Um, so, you know, a, a very, you know, a completely in that sense, you know, modernized secular figure. 1946, he suddenly decides. His, his main slogan of the All India Muslim League is going to be Islam in danger in India, and that this is going to be the magic formula that is going to make the majority of Muslims come out to vote for the Muslim League. And it worked, because in the, in the 1946 elections, the Muslim League scored a spectacular victory in the Muslim-dominated provinces under the separate electorate system. And therefore, they had the grounds to argue with legitimacy that they were the sole representatives of Muslim interest inside of the subcontinent. And of course, this was very, very important and very significant, because by 1946, you have a Labour government in Britain after the war, um, Attlee has already committed to decolonization and to Indian independence. Um, but as a result of this uh, election in 1946, what Jinnah does by using the slogan Islam in danger, he argues that because Muslims have to identify as Muslims and that they are in danger, it begins to unleash a level of communal frenzy that had not been witnessed on the subcontinent um, in, in its history at that time. And I mean, th there was so much violence, I'm not going to be able to go through all of this, but particularly in the city of Calcutta. Now, Calcutta as a city had been a very, very mixed city. That wasn't true of the whole of Bengal province, but it certainly was true of that city. 
Because of the violence that was unleashed, because of the slogan of Islam in danger, and because of the decades before that of where Muslims had been encouraged to see themselves as Muslims first and not as Indians, where Hindus were encouraged to see themselves as Hindus, you begin to see mass mobilization under the flag of the Muslim League and also under the flag of different Hindu fundamentalist outfits, particularly the RSS and the Hindu Mahasba at the time. Um, and the city of Calcutta, it was absolutely horrifying. In one day, there was an estimate of 10,000 people being butchered to death on the streets of central Calcutta. The areas that had always been mixed in that city, the neighbourhoods, suddenly people were forced to flee <coughs> and to move out of, uh, of mixed neighbourhoods, forcing themselves into more and more segregated, polarised ghettos. Tensions were so heightened by political leaders, not just by the national leaders like Jinnah, but also by reg regional leaders. So, for example, a Muslim League um, chief minister of Bengal turned around and said in, a, in one of the local newspapers, bloodshed and disorder are not necessarily evil in themselves if resorted to for a noble cause. And, of course, his noble cause was Islam in danger. Uh, we, have to defend, we have to defend Pakistan. The Calcutta killings were followed by communal violence right the way across other cities and other provinces, particularly in the north of India. They spread like wildfire through East Bengal, into Bihar, into the United Provinces, and then eventually they began to engulf the province of the Punjab uh, by March 1947. You know, to, to, to argue that one group was more responsible than another group really will not do justice to what was going on here because effectively what you were witnessing was tit-for-tat retaliations. The rumour was absolutely rife about what particular community was doing to uh, another particular community and you just had people hacking each other to death, abducting each other's women and what have you, going back to the quotes that I mentioned and the witness testimonies that I mentioned earlier on. Now... It's important to state that now that there was nothing inevitable about this, okay? In this period, as brutal as things were by 1946 and by 1947, uh, there was nothing inevitable about this. There could have been a very different, different picture. And there was a slightly different picture. You know, at the end of the war, people have this idea that just because the Br Britain was part of the Allies and that they were victorious, that somehow, you know, India was always secure as their possession. Well, it wasn't. In the middle of the war, in 1941, 42, 43, uh, the British were very vulnerable inside of India because the, the, the British had lost... Uh, Singapore, they had lost Malaya, they had lost Burma, the a Japanese army was literally right up into the frontiers of Bengal, <laughs> also inside of um, the Japanese army, uh, there had been a formation of the Indian National Army, which had been mostly made up by of Indian conscripts. Now, Indian conscripts were yeah, quite pissed off, quite frankly, with the wartime ordinances, with the fact that they uh, that there was starvation taking place because hordes of grains were being sent to the war front uh, during the war in 1943. There had been a famine inside of Bengal which some estimates put three to four million Bengalis had died needlessly as a result of the British redirecting grain. So there were lots of reasons why people were very, very miffed with the British. And so therefore they were more than happy to go into the Indian National Army. And the slogan of the Indian National Army was that, you know, uh, my friend's enemy is my my, yeah, my friend's enemy is my friend. And so therefore they were quite happy to side with the Axis powers to try and kick the British out. Now, sadly, they didn't succeed. But nevertheless, the British were very foolish because once they arrested the INA soldiers, they then began to put them on trial. One of the first trials that took place was in 1948 in Delhi at the Red Fort, and the British were so stupid, they hadn't learnt anything. They put on trial simultaneously a Muslim, a Hindu, and a Sikh. And the response of the Indian population, remember, this is when violence is taking place, was to rally to the cause of their fellow Indians in a united show of, of, uh, of strength. And it was very interesting because the trial was for treason, for which the penalty was death. Um, at the, the first trial had to be postponed because the British were too terrified of the united response by Indians. There was a second trial. Again, the British were too terrified and eventually the sentences were commuted. They could not carry out the death sentences um, on them 
uh, because in spite of the communalized frenzy that was beginning to take place, there was a massive show of strength and opposition to what the British were doing to these soldiers. It didn't stop there. In February 1946, there was a mutiny, this time, in the Royal Indian Navy. It began in uh, Bombay. Uh, here there had been you know, decades of uh, petty insults to Indians, grievances based upon uh, you know, sort of like a lack of promotion, low pay, uh, racism, open and hidden at the same time. Absolutely, uh, absolutely un unbearable conditions, and the uh, the, sol the 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 the, uh, the sailors decided that's it. They'd had enough, um, and they went out on strike. Not only did they go out on strike, but to demonstrate their unity, because the sailors were made up of Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Parsis, uh, Buddhists, what have you, etc. They flew on their masts of their ships because they'd taken over their <coughs> ships, the flags, and it was three flags that they put up the flag of the Indian National Congress, the flag of the All India Muslim League, and the flag of the Indian Communist Party to demonstrate that this was their show of unity in the face against the British and that they did not wish to be divided. In addition to that, they also demanded the complete freedom of the All Indian National Army uh, soldiers that had, been, uh, that had been put on trial and had been detained. This wasn't, and the, the mutiny spread, not, it began in uh, the city of Bombay, but it spread to the ports of Karachi, to the ports of Calcutta. In addition to that, you had thousands of people who were bringing them foods and supplies um, to the harbour for the sailors. Um, and, uh, yeah, anyway, anyway, so it was absolutely enormous. So the point I'm trying to make is that the story that I was painting earlier on is not the only story that could have taken place. And Nehru understood the significance of this. He said about the mutiny, the whole country is in the throes of serious discontent. We are sitting on the edge of a volcano which may erupt at any moment. A spark set ablaze Bombay, Calcutta and Karachi. These pre-storm conditions are not limited to big cities but are found even in the remotest villages. So he understood the significance of this. What did he do? Nehru, the great leader of Independence India, the so-called nationalists, the secularists, etc., etc., who wanted a united India? Well, he turned round and said, I want those who stand as an obstacle in our way, they should go their own way. Because the Muslim League were insisting on representation and there could be no agreement or consensus between Congress and the Muslim League, Nehru turned around and said, OK, Jinnah, you go your own way because I can't come to an agreement with you, so you go your own way. Worse still was to come from other nationalist leaders. You have the mutiny taking place. You have the uh, trial of the soldiers taking place. What do they say? Well, Patel, who was a Congress leader, turned around. He went with Jinnah and persuaded the mutineers to end their strike. Mm -hmm. um, and they turned around. Patel turned around and said, we will want the army even in a free India. So therefore, we can't tolerate this mutiny because you know this is this is this is serious you know this is illegal um gandhi went one further gandhi the peace the apostle of peace turned around and condemned the sailors for setting as he put it a bad and unbecoming example for india this in other words a show of unity is a bad example for india and he said a combination between hindus and muslims and others for the purpose of violent action is unholy Sadly, this had the impact of demobilising the tremendous unity in the strike wave that we had witnessed in that mutiny that was spreading to other cities. And that's very, very important. And the, you know, and the reason I say this is because it's important for us to understand that the history of partition, the violence of partition, there not only was there nothing inevitable about this, but there could have been a very, very different narrative that, would, that could have emerged. And this is very important because, you know, by the time we come to the end of partition, the landscape of South Asia has dramatically altered. Right? In 1941, Karachi, which was to become the capital of Pakistan, it had a population that was 47.6% Hindu. Hmm? Delhi, the capital of independent India, one third of that was Muslim. By the end of the decade... Hmm? Almost all the Hindus of Karachi had left Karachi and 200,000 Muslims had been forced out of Delhi. 
Mm -hmm. That is the horror of partition. Um, and, you know, when you think about the legacy that it is left today, to sum up, um, not only is it very important for us to remember what took place in 1947. Yes, you know, we want to celebrate the end of the colonial empire in India, but it's very important to understand that the kind of independence that came about, not only was that not an inevitable kind of independence, it could have been very different, because what are we left with? We're left today with two nation states that were born in blood and they stare at each other through daggers. These are both now nuclear armed states which have nuclear weapons aimed at each other's capitals to be able to wipe out each other's populations at the stroke of a second. Um, the, the whipping up of nationalist fervour that we see on both sides is absolutely terrifying and unpredictable as well. You know, Pakistan, some, some cases regarded as a, as a total basket case. It's been dominated by... Uh, by, uh, by um, military coups and army government etc you have a society in pakistan which is very very fractured at all sorts of levels the idea that it could be home to all of india's muslims you know, a lie is automatically given to that because some of the biggest victims of violence inside of pakistan have been shia muslims and have been other minority Muslims. So the idea that it could solve the problems for all of uh, India's Muslims is just, is just a, a complete and utter poppycock. And there are more Muslims inside of India than there are inside of Pakistan. So that it should also give us pause for thought. On the other side of the border, of course, in India, particularly today, you have the politics of Hindutva, of Hindi fundamentalism, not only being whipped up, but it has been cemented by the leader of the Indian state in the form of Modi. In India today, the level of witch hunting of Muslims is absolutely grotesque. For the last three or four years, every time there has been the Eid festival after Ramadan, there are stories of Muslims being lynched because they are accused of slaughtering cows. So this is the legacy that these horrible crystallized identities that were fomented deliberately in a certain period of India's history and the role of the British in doing this in terms of divide and rule cannot be underestimated in any shape or form. That doesn't mean to say that I'm saying that everything uh, to do with Hindus and Muslims is the fault of the British, but to somehow ignore the role of the colonial power and to ignore exactly what happened at different twists and turns of what that colonial power tried to do to hold on to its rule in India, you know, we would be sadly remiss if we were to ignore those facts. And therefore, when we think about the partition of India, we have to remember where the responsibility for the violence truly lies.